Hello and welcome to the Woodshed Podcast. I'm your host, Andy Brent, and today we're going to be discussing uh, education in jazz, primarily in context of young, early education. And I'm joined by three wonderful educators, and we'll get right into that. But first, I'm going to say our outro today is Pie Hole by RHS Horns from their album Commercial Break. RHS Horns is from Nashville, Tennessee comprising of students from Ravenwood High School. They're a small funk group, and their album consists of several covers of various standards and popular songs, as well as some originals, including the one that we'll play at the outro. So, very appropriately, I'd like to include um, a high school group, since that's what we'll be talking about today. And go check them out. I'll put the link in the description to the album below. All right. Um, So why don't you guys introduce yourselves? Um, my name's Donnie Fraunhofer. It's good to be here. Thanks, Andy. Um, my relevance to this conversation, well, my background is I play piano and keyboard instruments is my main instrument. I also play, um, basically all rhythm section instruments, uh, guitar, bass, um, drums, and that's specifically what I, what I teach. Um, my relevance to this conversation is... Currently, I am rely uh, making a living on a, being a gigging musician, but also I teach lessons freelance as well as substitute teach at various elementary, middle school, and high schools in Buffalo, New York. So, and as well, you know, my long term partner that I've been with also is uh, specialized in early education, um, but although she currently teaches at a high school, so. I'm around this er- this early education a lot. Uh, I am not certified in the state of New York, though. I do want to make that clear. And um, I'm glad to be here offering any opinions I have. Thanks. Uh, I'm Keith Lally. Uh, I have a background in music education. I went to Rutgers, Mason Gross. Um, I was I was classical, but you know I I I did my dabbling in the. Uh, in the jazz world and a couple ensembles and um i was friends with a lot of a lot of people in the jazz department and many a conversation was had and and such uh so i i love i love uh improvising i, I play in a band and there's like a lot of that going on um i as far as education goes uh obviously i had that music ed degree i'm currently um substitute teaching as as my main gig uh and i hang out a lot in the the band room um seeing what's going on in there a lot and you know uh, uh, i also a lot of shenanigans yeah um i also i i have a pretty strong marching band background as well i did a little drum corps and all that so Woo! yeah <laughs> right um i was like teching around for a while uh, uh off season you know not too much of that nowadays but yeah um and in general i just i just think a lot about the the role of classical of jazz of contemporary music I mean, these kids are running around, you know, listening to music all the time, blah, blah, blah. Anyways, so yeah, that's me. Uh, Hi, uh, I'm Cody Logan. Um, I'm a trombone music ed major at James Madison University. Um, And it is a mostly classical degree, but my what I like to focus on is jazz, but you have to do the classical to get the degree. Um, I'm also a... uh, music section leader for the marching royal dukes here so that's fun whoop, whoop. and uh, as far as teaching high school uh over the summers when i go back home i'm one of the uh what's my official title uh music tech staff something like that i don't even know my own title but i do that every summer and uh yeah i am about a little over halfway through my degree and hopefully when i'm done with it i can get a job at a high school so yeah that's me all right yeah so uh 
I'm not a music major or a music ed major, unfortunately, but I, uh, I do teach. Um, I have a few students, mostly uh, people who are just beginning uh, on trumpet. Um, I occasionally teach jazz, but not that often um, because my own education has been very, very uh, weak. Um, I, I, yeah, just because of a lot of reasons, a lot of teachers switching around in high school and we'll get into it. But, um, I do sometimes teach, uh, entire bands. I was a clinic at a high school recently or a clinician at a high school recently, which, oh man, I do love teaching kids. I love inspiring the kids, inspire the children. Um, but yeah, so one of the uh, before we started the podcast today, one of the things we were talking about was uh, teaching jazz first. And I think, uh, Keith, you had some things to say on that I'm interested to hear. Sure, absolutely. Um, so in general, uh, one perspective I like to approach teaching music from just overall is, you know, like you're, in teaching music, I think you should be teaching kids how to interact with, with music in the real world. Um and we start, it's it's kind of hard to say what genre, if any, you start in with, with elementary education, right? We're talking like grades three, four, five, maybe even as late as six, depending on your district and state and blah, blah, blah. I started um, seven. Yeah, exactly. So sometimes it happens. Um, so I think when you look at the kinds of music you're starting kids on, whether it's, you know... Um, whether it's what you're having them listen to, you know, I, I think a lot of a lot of early educators will be like, oh, here's Peter and the Wolf, and here's all these different instruments and what they sound like, versus, you know, what's actually in the ears of, of regular old people nowadays, you know, what's what's like in the 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 zeitgeist of like what music is like nowadays. And you see a huge disconnect um in in that you know what you're le- teaching kids how to play and what you're te- and what kids already listen to is very very far apart so i think i think teaching jazz first could be a, a good remedy for that um it's several except notches no, except kids don't start listening to jazz usually these days absolutely not no but um yeah. but i think there's a much easier to trace lineage between starting kids mm-hmm. out on jazz and, you know, making your way up through funk, which is way closer. And hip hop obviously yeah. is, is mm-hmm. in the, a big in the ears of, of kids today. So I think that's a, it could be a great place to start. And I don't think it has to be too different than how you already start now. I mean, if you, it's, you're teaching kids their first five notes and, you know, maybe instead of teaching them, uh, you know, B flat major scale, you're teaching them, you know, the B flat minor pentatonic and that's, you know, it, it, it's Jeez. it's just something that easy oh, to like move kids over you know what i mean um so that's that's my thoughts on starting so no that's mean? that's really interesting can i jump in here yeah sure sure um the one thing i guess i want a distinction of when we're talking about classical versus jazz is in my mind when we're talking about classical i'm thinking of written music that is played exactly as written well, if we're talking about jazz and funk um, and, you know, things like the B-flat minor pentatonic, it has that element of improvisation that I do think is, or, uh, I agree with Keith, is important to teach on early. So maybe to, to broaden the net, because, um, I mean, anyone can argue about what is jazz and what isn't. I'm going to use jazz as in, like, an improvisational music terms because i'm kind of in the camp with keith and also with like victor wooten is famous for talking about music as a language and kids when they're young talking you know in english or whatever their native tongue is they make mistakes syntax wise but we don't you know we don't scold them for that we kind of just laugh and imitate them and he said we should do things like that in music and i think that is important because if we do teach that music as a language and that improvisational aspect that jazz has. You know, it's like no, no kindergartner is writing essays yet. You know, like Keith said, you have to have that foundation of being able to speak and improvise and form sentences on the spot before you can be expected to write it down, like a classical piece, if I can kind of create that parallel between like, you know, like an essay and a classical piece. 
Yeah, yeah. Um, so just to jump off of that, you know, so again, similarly with language, kids are learning how to talk way before they learn how to read. I mean, you know, you're learning how to say like, I want that cereal or whatever it is, right? So I, I think another good way to start it off is maybe don't even worry about having them read yet. Uh, you know, they need to know what the sounds are like, because I think a lot of times kids focus on like looking at the page and don't really think about their sound. It's so hard to do both at the same time. So if you can get some kind of like call and response situation that you see in very, very early general music classes where you're just clapping a little rhythm and they clap it back. Like you can do that with instruments. Just play it like pick two notes and it's like, oh, you're playing this note like da, 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 da. And the kids will play it back. And then you play like da, 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 da. And the kids are like, oh, that's a different note, you know? So just getting that listening thing going earlier on. That that was a really good point, uh, point there, Cody. Or wait, who was talking, Donnie or Cody? It's Donnie. <laughs> uh, oh, well, Donnie, Cody, we're all making good points. We're all making good points. Um, yeah, I I agree. I think at, in the very least, jazz should be taught way earlier because I wasn't able to learn jazz. It wasn't offered till like eighth grade for me. I didn't start till high school, uh, sophomore year. But like, I feel just teaching classical unimprovised music number one gives you a certain mindset that, oh, uh, this instrument's only good for songs like from, you know, Beethoven or whatnot or Mahler. It's like, that's not, not a lot of kids listen to that. A lot like real young kids, at least not the kids I know. They're all listening to hip hop and rap and trash. But I mean, maybe. <laughs> hey, there's some good trash. I'm trying. There. Yeah, there's I was thinking I was like, hmm, maybe we can integrate more like pop things into our into the repertoire that we teach students. And then I was like cringing at the idea that someone's playing like Katy Perry as their beginning band concert. I was like, ah, but I, I mean, that. I have done that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I've done shit like that, too. But, but I. I think also teaching improv at an earlier age makes you more comfortable with messing up and making your own sound because, you know, it's like, oh, I, inst instead of like being classical where everything needs to be a certain way, you kind of get stuck in like, oh, I shouldn't, this sounds bad. Like if I play a note and bend it flat, that's bad. And it's just like, no man, that's jazz. But uh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I think we really need to expand past classical when we teach younger musicians to yeah. to really get them interested. I I, I agree, and I, I want to play devil's advocate for one minute, though, just because I think anyone listening with a classical Good. background will probably, <laughs> will probably say something like this. Um, the point of, well, the advantage about classical is it's, uh, it's grounded in a foundation a very strong technique that can be advantageous. And when I say very strong technique, I'm talking like, a, in terms of Western music, like a thousand years of, of, you know, people know, hey, when you're playing this piano phrase, you should, there's a reason there's numbers over, you know, classical pieces for kids, because it sets up their technique to play things in not just the easiest way, but the most efficient way. So I think that's a a good counterpoint to what we're saying. No, definitely. I think, and one of the things I was thinking about during this was like teaching straight versus swing, you know, oh, just yeah. by definition, swing is very loose and variable. I mean, you can swing hard, you can swing fast, you can swing slow, you can swing last. I just made that up on the spot, yo. <laughs> so... <laughs> um, but, I mean, it, I feel like you really, especially for that case, you should uh, start out straight, at least in the very beginning, so people know, you know, one, two, three, and four, and instead of, you know, everyone doing different uh, strengths of swing. So that's, yeah, there's definitely the advantage of, oh, there's all these... It's almost like you should learn the perfect way to do everything, so you know how to make it imperfect and like more spicy later. So Andy is is what you're from what I'm getting what you're saying maybe <laughs> oh god what am I about to say um 
I feel like starting starting with some like Latin stuff, honestly, or like I mean, there are contexts it's where just, you can take swing yeah. tunes and like maybe make them straight and they'll sound kind of mm-hmm. cool. But like, I, I I completely agree with you in that like it's way more fundamental of a skill to be able to play like straight time to just play straight eighth notes versus you know uh, anything else. But at and and a good point of um a good point on the other side of the argument, kind of like what Donnie was saying, is like a huge element of um of jazz is syncopation and when kids don't already have a huge like rhythmic foundation you know like you can start them off on quarter notes and that's great but like after that like what are you gonna do like have them start trying to like get upbeat stuff and i don't know at what age that's really appropriate to start trying to hammer into them but but yeah um And, and kids do have different perspectives of rhythm based on and we're talking about early education based on the early music they were, um, you know, exposed to. And there's studies actually about this, and I've experienced it myself, you know, where I'll teach a kid that maybe is from, you know, a background where he hasn't been exposed to a lot of jazz and his time will be straighter, while I'll be playing with people that primarily first heard music at like gospel churches, you know, on the east side of Buffalo, and they just swing everything, you know, they don't re- yeah. even have like a concept of, they can play straight, of course, but um, they're just prone to that, like, that's the rhythmic center. So I think too, like, it, it's the, the integration of music into like how you feel it starts before you even start playing it. So it's, it's a fascinating thing to just make that point yeah. i don't know absolutely i think um i think that uh, that kind of leads to my next point is that like there's not enough listening going on in classrooms in general and and not to say that there's not that it's not happening at all but i think the per- the model is very performance based and very like mechanically based and technically based and that's cool for sure but like you were saying like kids that are growing up listening to gospel or you know even if they are growing up listening to jazz like they they have the sound of it in their ear they can identify da 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 because like it's just like you said it's like how we acquire language it's you know you're just listening to it and listening to it and listening to it and you kind of it becomes a part of your like brain waves i don't know how to explain it <laughs> but you know like the the more you hear it the more likely you are to be able to do it so so i think that maybe not starting them off with swung stuff but if you're starting playing you know just quarter notes like you probably should be at that early age at the same time introducing to them music that is swung and it doesn't have to all be you know bebop or whatever like it can be a little gospel or it can be you know there are other genres that do that um and even now in rap actually early rap you yeah, hear a lot of like my name's Keith, and I'm here to say ka da ka da ka da ka da in a something way, you know, like... Was, like that, was, that, wow. the, was, that, wow. was that the rap, the... <laughs> that was the, the Jesus rap. The Jesus that rap? Was, I don't even know what that, that was. is. That's like all the 90s Dude. or late 80s, yeah. you know, like uh, peas and carrots and the carrots and peas, you know, like, and uh, kids pick up on that. Sugar Hill Gang. Yeah, it's That's definitely the Sugar Hill Gang right there. <laughs> And uh, just sort of going off what you were saying, Keith, uh, one uh, idea that we've been talking a lot in my music education classes is just starting the day listening to something and it being different every day. Just to oh, expand. That's good. I like that. Yeah, because like you could have one day where you do, you listen to like an excerpt of Mahler or two, but then the next day you're listening to, who knows, Sugar Hill Gang, like you were saying, <laughs> or, you know, a straight up. Coltrane tune and that'll just get something in their brain because you'll have a kid who'll hear something they've never heard before and be like oh what's that I want to look into it more and if we start that early because like I didn't really listen to jazz at all until high school late high school because in middle school it just wasn't something I was ever exposed to something I was I was thinking about um, while you guys were talking is You know, when I first started jazz, um, learning jazz, they said, you know, listen to a lot and you'll, you'll get jazz, which isn't true. That's not all you have to do. The, the trick is to play what you hear, not just listen. And I didn't figure that out for a long time because I was stupid. So I wasted a lot. Well, I didn't waste time, but anyway, you know, they, but I've never in my recollection heard a, 
I'll just, I mean, I'll just say a, a, a high school or middle school band director in general say, you know, okay, listen to classical and play what you hear, you know? <laughs> Yeah, well, there's know, not, there would it, be nothing wrong with that in general. I mean, it's not either. Yeah, really. But it's like I never hear that jazz is. But in jazz, that's pushed. It's like you know, that's, you have really to. exactly. I and I thought that was a really interesting thing. Absolutely. I mean, there's no reason why. I mean, with all the the, if you have a pair of speakers and a phone and YouTube like in your classroom, like you can you can have kids listen and then you can say like hey this measure is really i mean you can prepare it in advance and they'll have no idea what you're talking about but you can prepare it in advance and say like hey this measure is actually really interesting and take like a really simple lick from an otherwise like regular or even like advanced like piece of music and say like this part sounds like really cool like let's see if we can figure out like what the notes are and you know like Mm -hmm. do a little like baby master class with like one or a few of the kids actually in lessons i mean if you have pull out lessons that's that's the place to do that i think like a really good teaching strategy for younger kids would be group well, I don't know how you do it, but like, yeah, group transcription. Like, you listen to it Whoa. and say, everyone, okay, everyone go around, try to play it. <laughs> it could be classical, it could be jazz. That sounds amazing. I, I, and <laughs> yeah, that, I just, that blows my mind. I never even thought of that, you know, just having kids try, like, trying transcription in class because, I mean, even if you're doing it with classical music or with funk or with gospel or with rock and roll, like, that's, that's like the whole point of the the system of like how jazz is acquired by musicians you know like that's like how you learn the language and i think maybe more so even than specifically like what you know like learning bebop or learning swing or learning anything it's like learn that skill like that's what you need to be teaching you need to be teaching that skill so they can interact with any kind of music they want and have those ears yeah i think oral skills you know, being able to hear music and especially transcription, learning it by ear, whether you're writing it down or even just playing it back um, is like, that's where I stand is that's most important to me is you want to do that before you start, you know, reading music and stuff. Because, you know, I I think if you're going to improvise and especially in jazz, oral skills are the most important, you know, hands down. I agree. Yeah, and there's no way you can play what's on the page unless you understand what you want your sound to be. And the only way to know that is to hear what that sound should be in the first place. Uh, that See, I disagree with that specifically. I mean, I think in theory, like in an ideal world, you're right. But you're almost, I would say every <laughs> every music program I've encountered you're starting kids out reading the notes and they don't necessarily know what it's going to sound like because they've never fucking... They, uh, sorry, can I curse? <laughs> oh, oh, what do you mean? Can it's in curse. I don't remember. Okay, okay, great. Uh, I forgot. You've li- you edited the podcast. You know what Listen. fucking goes on. All right, all right. All right. Uh, but my Unless point is sh- you can, you can read can the page censored down. version for your students. <laughs> you can read the page. Oh, yeah, great. I'll bleep it out. Every time it bleeps, we'll bleep it'll, it out it'll with play the Gucci lick. Gang. It'll be great. <laughs> I heard that. Gucci, Gucci, Gucci Gang. Okay. Um, oh, fuck no. off. Uh, I'm getting off topic. Oh my. my point is you can, if you're in fourth grade, like look at a page and have no idea what it's supposed to sound like and play it anyways and get your gold star or whatever you get, you know, like because teachers aren't, they don't seem to consider that part of the process because, and maybe this can transition into some other section, you tell me. Because that's not like how we're teaching music educators, future music educators to learn, uh, to teach kids. You know, I I don't hear anything about like how to teach kids how to listen um, going on. Like I went through my music education program and that was not like a huge subject at all. Oh, for sure. And where I'm getting my like basis for this is in my individual lessons in college. My professor has really harped on me to always know what my sound is going to be before I play, because that's the only way I'm going to make that sound. And I think the way that we do teach kids, especially when they're young, is to just, you know, look at the page, play something, and they might think it sounds good, and maybe it does to them, but that's because they have no actual, like, oral <laughs> perception. They have shit taste. <laughs> well, yeah, and maybe they've never listened yeah. to you know, an orchestral section or a big band section before. Yeah. I mean, a lot of, I remember 
especially getting into high school a lot, they say, you know, hear the sound before you play. And I don't know that. Yeah, whatever. I guess as a group, though, really, really as a group, though, like, oh, this is what the group should sound like. Yeah, I don't think that's really taught. I, yeah, like you said, like uh, the bi- big band, what is that supposed to sound like? You know, don't really know unless you listen to big bands that have come before. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's, yeah. it's people make the argument, oh, well, that's I mean, that's breaking creativity. You should just play and that's completely original yeah you need to fuck off well <laughs> you also can that's be not original it's not you can be original while still listening to people well it's important to understand everything that brings up like a good topic going back to like teaching jazz first is when we're talking about teaching jazz too often kids are taught jazz but it's in the big bands like you're talking about and it doesn't have quite the improvisational nature that you can get with yeah. the arena of jazz that is like quartets, quintets, even sextets, you know, you can get much more improvisation with that than a big band. So that's the thing too. Do we do we have the kids do big bands so they can understand the harmony first and just have small improvisations before they move into quartets or should we, you know, start them off improvising more in a smaller even trio setting, you know. So the problem with that is not I I love I love that. I think that would be great and I wish I had had that in my education, you know, I cuz I always wanted to play combo stuff. I well, in high school I loved like big band, but I always wanted to it felt more prestigious to play in a combo and I always wanted to play in a combo and that was never offered to me. And I think one of the big reasons for that is not it's it's more because of, uh, you know, we have a lot of students that want to play, mm-hmm. or at least around here you do. So you have to accommodate all of them. And if you have multiple combos, it's kind of hard to give a lot of, you know, instruction to each person, uh, especially yeah, like in uh, high schools and middle schools. But um, another well, thing I wanted to say, kind of related, or well, uh, Keith, you can say your part because mine's kind of... No, it was basically going to be the, the exact same thing. I mean... But I I don't think that inherently means you can't do it. I mean, if you're in a program that's lucky enough yeah. to have to have pull out lessons, you know, where you've got your you're hitting your ensemble stuff, whether it's you know a, a wind ensemble concert band style thing or or a big band style thing, which I mean I think that should be the norm because you know like number one you always have too many percussionists, so now you just have you know three drummers or however many depending on your your size and then you know a couple maybe you can get rhythm like i don't know like teaching piano in a band class is not something i've ever like thought about before but but yeah so so i don't know but you have your ensemble class and then for your lessons you can you know throw on an abrasol track and and mess around and do some listening and transcribing and like that could be the vibe you know yeah i agree so What do you guys think about the type of jazz, or at least around where I've lived, that's being taught in, uh, like, high schools and middle schools? Because the type of jazz I grew up playing was not what I love now. Or actually, it wasn't even what what I was listening to at the time. You know, we played, uh, it was a big band, and we played Radiohead, Mm -hmm. which... A lot of people hate on that arrangement, but I think it's a great learning tool. Which which uh, song did you guys play? Um, I think we played Idiotech, and then I played everything in its everything in its right place in college. Nice, we did that one for the short time I was in that band. But um, you know, we also played Eleanor Rigsby. uh, We played that Rigsby, and then just some other tunes. And when we like very similar to that, we played like rock tunes. And we did, I mean, we did occasionally play, like, real, like, better <laughs> better jazz, I guess. You know, I mean, we, we played Get It On. I'm just going to throw that out there because I just thought of it, and it's not really to illustrate my point, but Get It On by Bill Chase. He's my he's my honey. He's beautiful. I love him. Yeah, that's my marching Rest band's anthem. Oh, oh, holy shit. You got to send me that. I oh, love absolutely. marching band we Bill Chase. We have 500 Chase. people. It's pretty insane. Oh geez, but um, that's wild. 
you know, when we finally played, gosh, it was, uh, da, 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 da. It's a Thad Jones, uh, piece. That was like, you know, I was really close to the, to the real getting into jazz. And that was amazing. And I was like, this is the music I want to play. But we ended up mostly playing like pop tunes and rock. And we sure as hell didn't play any traditional songs. Like, we tried to play like nature boy. It didn't fucking work. And I feel like that's missing out a lot on, I I feel like you should explore jazz bands, especially an early age should explore the entire genre Mm -hmm. to really let people know what's there. I mean, because a lot of, and you know, the, the reason I'm saying this is because young kids don't come in as jazz artists. They don't come in loving jazz and whatnot, usually. They they come in with a very, most likely, narrow point of view of what jazz is. It's either smooth jazz or New Orleans old oldie stuff. But, I mean, I think the best course of action would be to t- teach all of it. Traditional, funk, avant-garde. I don't know if you want to do free jazz at that level. That I mean, the high the rehearsal practice room already sounds like that. But <laughs> I mean, I think teaching free jazz and this is a whole another topic might be philosophically against what free jazz is about. If that makes sense. <laughs> no, 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 yeah. Well, now That's you're good. getting on the subject in general of like the academicization. I mean, of jazz, yeah. which is. Mm-hmm. That is, it's a very divisive issue. That's an elephant in the room yeah. that we have kind of not talked about, um, which, yeah, is a whole. I mean, I can see both sides of that debate. So, yeah. I just always think you need direction, at least, though. Mm-hmm. Sure, and 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 what other way are they going to learn about? you know, the, the history of this country's music, whether we, I mean, it, maybe it starts at st- the blues and the swing and jazz, but like you can use those, those theories to cover any genre, kind of like Andy was saying, like you, you should be doing some like Count Basie and then, um, like, uh, and maybe Radiohead, like, I don't know, uh, like you should be able to cover the entire like spectrum. And I think you should like, at least with like sight reading every week or something. Yeah, so 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 real quick, can someone like give a very uh in depth, not very in depth, but like a quick rundown of this debate of teaching you know the uh, not the ethics. I don't know. I think it is it, it's a but, question you know, of like I mean. ethics in a way. So so jazz, I mean if you know about the history of jazz, it started out uh as the as the music of like black Americans and it came from a place of a lot of like individuals that were working in the the social circumstances they were in, you know, you've got Charlie Parker and he's just chilling in his woodshed for 11 hours a day and just playing a lot and listening <laughs> a lot. And, yeah. Well, I mean, you, you, you gotta, you gotta shut him out. But then, but, but then you, you did have a lot of like really organized ensembles. Like I'm very curious to like, how did, you know, Duke Ellington's band rehearse back in the day? And they, I'm sure to some oh, degree, they are, were all trained. Story. They were all trained in some way, right? Like, I mean, they, 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 they had to have some kind of background that wasn't just like, they weren't just like playing on their own and then they would show up at a rehearsal and they were good, you know, like they had to have some kind of formalized yeah. training, right? Well, I think when, and where I stand too is when people come at, I don't know, the academia of jazz, I definitely have many issues with it, but the fact of just teaching jazz for me and have having an issue with that is problematic because yeah back then people were teaching jazz it was just through an an, more of an apprentice type thing you know like my miles would play in a band start learning move to new york go to all the shows start hanging out and like practicing and playing with guys and you learn from the people you're around with and yeah they wrote down you know, they did write down music and charts back then. You know, the, this whole um, myth that they just, you know, wrote these songs and just got up and played them is just not exactly, you know, it's it's not true. They, they were, especially Duke, writing out this music. So uh, this idea that jazz wasn't academic to begin with just because 
it existed, like Keith said, under poorer circumstances, I don't think is holds a ton of water for me personally. I think the big divisive part of it becomes once you get to the college level where you've got music schools that are there. I mean, you're paying, you know, what, $50,000 a year, whatever it is to to get taught to, to, you know, they've taken this process that maybe started out as just this community of musicians. And now they've turned it into like this whole system. I don't want to call it a scam by any means, because, you know, you see people coming out of programs and they go on to like move and shake jazz as a genre. But, <laughs> but, but like you, they are profiting off of it in a way. And, and, you know, when you think of academia and college, it is a very like Europeanly structured thing. And, you know, not to, not to make the, it, it, it's more of a class argument maybe than anything else, you know, like you've got people that can afford to go to college and, and stuff that are like, it's, they've, they're taking over in theory, like they're getting the best educations in this field now. Uh, not to say there aren't other ways to do it, but it obviously has become like systematized, and I think that's maybe the divisive part of it. Tell me, tell me if you think I'm wrong. You know, I definitely would agree there, because like, if you're not some sort of childhood virtuoso, basically, there's not a lot of ways to break into the music world like there were back in the day. But yes, I agree. I feel like that's just the times and how things are, because say you're a middle ground musician. If you want to do something, as long as you have the status to go to college, get the education, you have a shot. But if you're, you know, 17, a middle ground musician, you can't go to college for this. There's not too many options yeah. for you out there. At, at least not with structure. I mean, yeah. in theory, you could go on YouTube and like learn how to shred. I, I really do that's strongly true. believe that. Like there are so there are more resources now today than ever. Mm -hmm. But that's not like when I graduated from high school that no one was telling me like, well, you know, if you just practice a lot on your own and maybe pay for lessons like once a, a week or two and then go on YouTube and just look all this stuff up yourself. And here's the listening list. Like no one was saying that to me. It's like they're saying go to college. They're pushing this like you need to go to college. Yeah for this kind of thing and that's yeah. that's not to say that's good or bad but like no one it, like that's what how the system works right now and that's like you know my friend wyatt who's been on the podcast you know he's a uh he's a music performance no he's not he's a jazz major um but you know he gets a lot of lot lot of opportunities to go gigging with people he goes to jam sessions and these are like a lot of them are sponsored by the university or mm -hmm. the university has him do this. Yeah. And which is, which is amazing. And I wish I had that in high school. I mean, because I don't remember the exact quote, but it's like, you know, you practice, you get better, you play with better people or you play with people that are better than you. So you practice more and it's just a cycle when you play with older or better musicians, that's very conducive to your growth and that was absent in my um, uh, early education. I mean, I, I started in high school, but definitely never played with another group. There were never any, any opportunities to do that. It was all, you know, very just, you know, school concerts. Nothing, nothing ever else. Yeah, we tried I, to do our own thing, and we, you know, we didn't have direction. It's not like even if we made a band, we could play anywhere because we didn't have that support. Mm -hmm. Um, it's just that's that's a really big problem in jazz, I think. Yeah, you know, I mean, um, go, go ahead, go. Keith. Oh, well, I was actually going to ask you because it sounded like because you you posted that link before uh, in the Discord of like your band, and I think you were talking about how no, that's you're like, that was me. Oh, my bad. <laughs> See, I'm mixing everyone up. I'm mixing everyone up. Um, but yeah, the the link before about how you it's like you know you didn't oh, have yeah. like the outlet necessarily that you wanted, so you just went off and started your own thing. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, I I don't think it's too outside the realm of possibility to say that if you wanted to start a, a rock band or a jazz group or whatever, that like I think a school, um, at least at the high school level, should be able to provide you resources, or be able to provide you some kind of structure. You know, I fucking yeah. wish uh, that would I, be amazing. I, th I think the most important thing, too, what we're talking about education and jazz education is playing with other people and a lot of different yeah. people. And 
you know, a lot I've of better people. Yeah, a lot of better people, yep. and even people that are just your friends that maybe aren't as good as you, but you're doing the same kind of apprentice thing. I, you know, I heard Mark Giuliana talk, and he was talking about learning the instrument, and he kept going back to. He's like, when I look back, the most you know profound thing that affected me was just playing with a lot of different people. And if I could actually shout out to Wyatt, if we're talking about playing with different people, I actually jammed with him in Denver. And when I was in, uh, uh, before I knew him from the group, I, uh, I played with him in Denver. I was on tour with my band and I looked up like a jazz jam that was happening that night. I went and I ended up playing, uh, I think, all blues with him. And I was just hanging out and like hadn't met him, but didn't make the connection yet. So, hey, Wyatt, <laughs> I just wanted to say that it was a we- weird, weird thing. So, yeah, he's an amazing player. He's yeah, one of he, the best he, at the he university. Was, he was great. It was, it was awesome. He's not even a grad student yet. Yeah, he's, uh, Wyatt's great. You know, and I think um, just another thing with trying to bring these experiences to the high school setting, because, you know, while I've been here at college, I've been able to play with some of the best trombonists in the country, if not the world, both classical and jazz. But yet in high school, you know, the only outlet I had to play with other people focusing on this was just my classmates playing on her own in a band. But like, I think the whole system of public education and their devaluation, I think that's the word, of the arts overall yes. really mm-hmm. stops, you know, getting someone big coming to a high school. And I mean, you still see it happen every now and then, but I know there was never any guest artist at my high school, at least. No, I, I completely nope. agree. Yeah. My, like I was saying, my, my girlfriend, she, uh, she's been uh, teaching and leading the jazz and jazz band program at a high school and helping with the musical. And she spent, ends up, you know, spending you know, a lot of money out of pocket just to, you know, have like food for like a long rehearsal or things like that, because there's not room in the budget. And, you know, most of the budget is spent on just trying to, you know, fix, like, you know, they have tons of instruments, but they're all broken, you know, Mm -hmm. and it's in, because this is a city school. Um, So they spend all their budget on that, or, and just hiring other musicians to play in the pit band because the their music program oh, is yeah, so defunded and small yep. that they don't even have you know proficient musicians in their own high school to play in the in the pit band, so they end up spending all their money on that to just to get you know I've done I've freelanced and done that a few times you know played in a, a pit because no one you know in the in the high school band could play the part. That I think that happens a lot of places. Uh, I mean I I. I've been to a bunch of different districts and like almost every district is doing that to some degree. That's, I mean, you know, when you have like, you know, certain, certain musicals, especially like you have like a bassoon part and you know, how many, how many schools really have like super strong bassoon players or something like yeah, that? You true, know, true. Yeah. my school had zero bassoon players. Well, there Same. you go. Yeah. I, for, I did forget. I should mention when I was in like a pit for a, uh... actually, you know what? Um, doing musicals was probably the the best education I had, both classical and jazz. I agree, one hundred percent. That that music and is fucking hard. It's and insane. I mean, it transitions from like jazz to rock to funk like mm-hmm. super Ex- quickly. Yeah, you know? it's a lot of different. It can Modu- be a lot of different genres. Lots of modulations which... too, especially oh like gosh. in codas. I have in, in codas. It's just modulating like five times in the last you know Use forty fucking... bars. Use fucking 40 mutes in the span of 10 seconds. I'm going insane. I had to buy a mute stand. And you know what? That I What's funny is, ironically, the problem of not having musicians turned into a positive thing because I literally was playing trumpet with my teacher at the time, I remember. And he's a great trumpet player. Shout outs to, to Mr. Clannon. Um, but, um... I mean, it was great. I mean, just literally sitting right next to him and playing and hearing how he played. And just, I mean, that's where I learned a lot of the jazz techniques like scoops and whatnot. Or like, just, it was it was great. I, forgot, I completely forgot about musicals. 
Um, so yeah, yeah. Here's, shout here's out to my, them. Also, to also musical though, theater. as like entertainment, musicals are shit. But definitely play in the band. <laughs> here's my story when it comes to musicals. So I did stage crew for the majority of my high school career. Um, just because it was like a, you know, in, I came from a program where you had to be involved with like every single musical aspect of like the, the like you had to do choir and band and this and that. And like oh, I was shit. doing stage crew just wow. to, you know, like get in good there. Um, well, because it was all interconnected. It was a, that's a whole different story. But anyways, so I, the last Wait, is year this during high school. Yeah, my, I went to South Brunswick High okay. School. It At the time, it was um, the band director was Mark Kraft and the choir director was Ginny Kraft. And they were married and like they had this like whole powerhouse, like marching band, like system going on. And yeah. So anyway, so I I signed up my last year for the the pit because they were doing guys and dolls and I was about to, you know, go shit myself off to music school. And I'm like, I've never done a musical, you know? And like, I feel like I need to do it before I go off. And I signed up and then, and then the choir teacher, the musical director, whatever, like she, she came up to me and she's like, uh, yeah, you're going to be in the musical. And I'm like, that's not what I signed up for. And they were like, she was like, well, it's guys and dolls and we need guys. And I was like, but I'm like going to go. I'm going. We, have, this we already is have my enough music. dolls. We need guys. <laughs> That's And she, she straight up just like denied me the opportunity to play in the pit, which kind of sucked. And at yeah, the time she... I couldn't really do. I was under their their iron grip and, you know, nothing against them. I, I, I get where they're coming from. But also like I to this day, I've actually never, uh, never played in a musical. Funny story. Oh, they're fucking uh, insane. Yeah. They're they are a new level of difficulty. Because the books you get are Broadway books. It changes keys every five seconds. Mm. Yeah, last year I played In the Heights in a pit uh, by Lynn Manuel Miranda. And that was fucking a crazy score. Yeah, no, it was a cool Latin musical, music. though. I ended up listening to it like a bunch after and just nerding out and being like, I don't know about the play, but this music's fucking killing. It was like, you know, Lynn manuel Miranda, it's cool because he incorporates, like, a lot of... This one had a lot of, like, Latin jazz with, like, hip-hop beats. So it was, like, it's really dope. cool. I have a friend who wrote a whole, uh, like, he's written, like, several, like, college papers on, on Lynn manuel Rivera's work. It's, like, very, very cool and very hip. It, that's, that's something where if you're, you're... We're tying it back to education, like... What a what a great place to to start kids off on as well because you know Broadway is still relevant in the the contemporary like realm of music you know um, you've got people going to Broadway shows there's new Broadway shows coming out um, and the music like you guys said is really challenging and it does incorporate a lot of the instruments you start kids out on like I think that's that's a great um, a great avenue to like you know I don't know about starting kids off but definitely for like just helping them like listen and get the sound in their ears. And it's something way closer that they listen to that uh, closer than the music they listen to every day, you know? Oh, absolutely. And like my, uh, the last, the second to last musical I actually played in, uh, on trombone, uh, we did state fair. It's not very well known, but one of the songs had a shout chorus that was straight out of a big band arrangement, basically. And it was, insanely challenging and it was probably the most challenging shout chorus i had played up until joining a college ensemble and i remember just sitting there and playing and practicing that longer than i ever did anything in high school more than my audition pieces and yeah and i think if we can have those opportunities for kids especially even younger maybe not starting off on the actual broadway books because there are you know reduced scores out there maybe starting with that and moving them up that's just an excellent opportunity and it might even get kids in there who wouldn't even be in an actual like jazz band setting because you know there's violins in a pit orchestra but there's not often violins in a big band yet you could get those kids more involved in jazz altogether by doing these types of shows. Yeah, uh, I, I definitely agree. Like you were saying, it, you know, the challenging aspect is, is always good for a musician. I mean, you have to challenge yourself to get better. Um, and if I could actually <laughs> switch topics and segue to a new way, one, uh, something I brought up 
in the chat that I, I want to talk about in particular is um, why there aren't really any composition classes or, you know, until you get to college. Mm -hmm. You know, there's, I, there's, I've never, in my experience, and someone tell me if I'm wrong and they have a different experience, I've never seen any sort of compositional class offered in any early education. So let me, I mean, I didn't. I don't, I don't think it was offered at my school, but I think there's two factors that play into that. And it's not, I mean, I think these should be changed, but there's two things. One is a problem we already went over. Impro improvisation is not being taught as strongly. And I think that, you know, obviously helps a lot with composition. Uh, just, you know, ideas. That's, it's as simple as that. Mm -hmm. And another yeah. thing is music theory is not taught very well, at least in my uh, middle school not. and high school. There was, you know, what's funny is um, we, I maybe had two days of music theory uh, in high school. I was never even taught how to read chord changes. What, I literally learned that like a couple months ago from Wyatt. Mm. <laughs> Shout outs to Wyatt again. That's crazy. But which is insane. And I just can't believe they, I, and I knew at the time I was like, Oh, I just, I don't even know what to do. And they're like, ah, it's not that big of a deal. Well, yeah, it fucking is. <laughs> but I mean, that's, that's why I'm that's so a huge shit deal. now. The Look at the what? lasting effects. <laughs> yeah. But, um, it's just like, they didn't have time. It's almost like I was, I would just learn as I, you know, it's, it's because, okay. So we only had in the end one band, one jazz band, because mm -hmm. we didn't have enough people to split into like beginning, like first year band. There's not like, you know, this is your first year of jazz band where you can learn all this. No, it was just jazz band. So you're expected to just catch up with all the seniors, which sure, that's great, but I'm not going to, I, you know, I spent three years in the jazz band. I didn't fucking learn how to read chord changes. No <laughs> one told me. No one's going to take the time. And another thing that's funny is, you know, we have AP classes around where I am. Uh, I think there's an equivalent called IB. Yes, we had IB. But yeah, so AP, Internet or Advanced Placement, it just, they're very hard classes. You take a test at the end of the year, and if you score high enough, you get credits for college. Really, that's that's a whole nother issue We can, that's not really related to this about AP classes. But anyway, um, they always said... And this was offered at my school, but I didn't do it because I was doing other I, – I was a very AP boy. I did everything AP, so I couldn't also pile this on. But they always said AP music theory was the hardest, most difficult course our, our high school offered, even above AP Mandarin Chinese. That's, that's I don't really know crazy. if that's true, but – I do believe in any case it was very difficult. Yeah, I think like the the hardest ones were Mandarin Chinese, chemistry, computer programming and music that my school offered I, in whatever order. But yeah, I yeah, agreed. E easier than calculus and biology. Yeah. Or uh, sorry, harder. And, is what I meant. But yeah. I I think like in early education like you were saying music theory kind of fails big time. And only because I, you can, I genuinely believe you can learn music theory better, like on the internet. I think to play your instrument and technique, you need to be with someone. But I genuinely believe if you have the, like it, the resource of the internet, like the way it, or you have to know where to you look. can, and uh, like YouTube videos can bring together like. Basically, all your like seriously, I you know I shout outs to Adam Neely. Please come on the podcast. <laughs> Yay! Yep. But uh, I I think he would agree with this. Uh, you know, YouTube videos where you can see someone playing, or they make a visual where there's mm -hmm. you know the staff notation above on the piano. You see the piano roll playing it, and you hear it all at the same time. You can I think you know that way of w losing. Of, or I'm sorry, learning music theory kind of has an edge over what early education is offering right now. Um, quick shout out to uh, how I learned bass, which was purely <laughs> by Rocksmith, which is 
you think it would be bad, but if you are a musician, especially if you're a musician and you're wary of how you're practicing, Rocksmith is a great tool for learning. Oh my gosh, I should I should get sponsored by them. It's a it is a great tool for learning guitar and bass, but um, <laughs> it's uh, also there's not many jazz songs on there, but the ones that are the fucking hardest songs for bass at least, like Sir Duke whoops my ass every time. But small shout out to that. Uh, don't be you can download some songs. So oh, also actually. You know what you can do, and this isn't a very big market, and I'm pretty sure it's kind of shady, but you can go on YouTube. So if you figured out Rocksmith and how to work, it's basically Guitar Hero, but you play with a real guitar. You put your guitar into the computer. But um, anyway, you can go on YouTube, and people have made custom tracks, which you can also download into Rocksmith, but it gets a little complicated. But you can watch people play these tracks, And you can, it's basically almost like learning tabs and you can look up. There's, I remember Django by the modern jazz quartet, Stray Cat Strut. You can actually like look up these songs and play them and it's fun. But anyways, that's, that's a good tool. I don't think many people are aware of who play guitar or electric bass. Anyway, sorry. This podcast has been sponsored by (laughs) Rocksmith 2014. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, I, I was doing jazz. I was doing very similar stuff, but I, okay. So I, let's see, what year must it have been? I was, I know, in like fifth and sixth grades. So this must have been two thousand and oh, fuck, I'm old. Two thousand and like six, maybe. I don't know. Um, five, whatever. I was, I was, I, I was listening to a lot of like. I I discovered Fallout Boy, and I wanted to know how all the Fallout Boy <laughs> songs were put together. So I would look at the tabs, but like I didn't really have a guitar. I don't think at that time. So I downloaded the program, and what was the name of it? It was called like um, it was, like, it was Power Tab. It was Power Tab. And it would uh, something like that, and it was like it would play the songs in like MIDI, and it would like scroll along with the um, it would scroll along like you hit play, and it would scroll along the songs, and it was just like just watching like how the songs were put together, and it's like oh like these are power chords, that's cool, like oh he was playing like that line at that time, and I I would spend hours just looking at that stuff, and and I mean just that was in two thousand what like five, and now it's twenty eighteen, and you've got Muse Score, and you've got you know, you've got so many resources that if you're trying to learn how to compose, like as an educator, you can definitely give them that, uh, you can give them that. And, and also, man, what was some other point? I got distracted by something. Um, my whole point was like, it's, it just everything that you guys have been saying, like there's so many programs and resources online that like can supplement the things that you can't necessarily do in the classroom. The individual attention you can't give in the classroom can be supplemented by like, you know, freaking freaking what's that? What's that piano one where it like comes down and like, like, oh, rain, synesthesia? like mini notes. something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's that's so, and you can use that for composition. I mean, you I just learned take piano shit on piano and, is back in, you know, early 2000s when YouTube was brand new and free. People would, you know, put stuff up on there. And I, it was easier to learn visually than than reading music, which I knew how to do. But I didn't want to bother with that for, you know, once I, you know, when when I was a kid and. Yeah, so I I can definitely attest I used that when I was younger. Yeah, I think I think it's good too because now there there's got to be a way where you can do that and also just happen to add in like whatever the written notation looks like. That way, at least it's there for people who are like, oh, by the way, this is what it sounds like, and this is what my fingers look like. But also, this is if you wanted to write it down, this is what it would look like as well. And if you're a kid who's got some kind of like any kind of background, if you've been in your music program in your band classes or whatever for like a couple years like you'll you should be able to recognize that you know i mean i got i did i guess have sort of a composition class which was intro to music tech which ironically i'm taking now in college which is a fucking amazing class anyway but it's like oh yeah you want to compose open up garage band and just put those sick loops 
Oops. 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 Well, I hate myself now. I remember specifically. So there was this guy who was really, really, really fucking good. And I was making my piece, and I was like a baby freshman, I think. And I remember writing this thing. I was like, hey, this sounds this sounds pretty good. And I, I had him listen to it because he was my senpai. And I was like, senpai, please notice me. And he's like, <laughs> he's like, your fucking song is shit, man. Using those parallel fifths. How fucking dare you insult me with that oh shit? And I was like, I was like, what are you, what, what's going on? <laughs> Andy, no parallel fifths. I st- Get I out of here really with that know- shit. I still don't really know what those are. I mean, I could guess. <laughs> but I remember, spe- especially at that time, I was like, what the fuck is a fifth? What's going on? And he, like, totally, like, shat on my piece. He's like, you have fucking parallel fifths everywhere. What, are you, are you trash? <gasps> oh, also, uh, I don't know if this will be that funny, but now since I'm on the topic, also, in that same room, um, so there's this, there's this really, really, really quiet girl, like, super, super shy, and she's working on her composition project for that class. And she's just working quietly, you know. And this guy behind her, literally, I just walk in and see this happening. And she's like shaking. This guy behind her is just screaming bad death metal into a mic behind her. Just, <laughs> and she's just shaking in the corner. Oh, but oh, yeah, anyway, ridiculous. I uh weird spot to compose I, music. That's a crazy re- that's a crazy <laughs> high school experience. <laughs> Turns out they're actually doing a avant-garde jazz album together. <laughs> but <laughs> seven yeah, seven I, years I, later they're married. Yeah. I remember very distinctly um just doing garage band and feeling like a piece of shit because it's garage band mm-hmm. and then going on Muse score and getting frustrated with that and What's funny is I remember these huge, fucking huge textbooks, and, and on on the top of them just said logic, and I was like, "Oh, what's yeah. this?" And they're like, "Oh, you're you you're not ready for this yet," which, so I mean, it would have been cool to learn logic in high school, but I think it is kind of important to learn all these free programs because you know. When you're at that age, you're not maybe that into making music. You're not going to go to college or, you know, become a producer uh, per se. But, like, it gives you the skills to work with the free programs that most people start out with. So I can't really hate on them for that. Although, fuck GarageBand. Logic is king. Yeah, I logic's what it's all about. Uh, I think... I think writing music too. I'm gonna I'm gonna say my my opinion of why I think I don't know if it should be taught, but you know, for I I guess for anyone listening, I think you should start writing and composing music as soon and early as possible, regardless of your skill. Because in my experience, it has actually just made me better. Because oftentimes, when I was younger, I would write things outside of my skill that I would then have to learn or be able to play or or (laughs) on the flip side like you're gonna write shitty things like that just happens to everybody oh yeah. but you might as well start writing shitty things as soon as possible to get to the good stuff like that and (laughs) that you might might have a few gems in there a couple seconds yeah i I mean i've written a lot of music and then you find out they're parallel fifths and everything is shit (laughs) oh god (laughs) yeah i've written written a lot of music with parallel fifths that i had to throw away but then i got to the sus fours and i mean (laughs) once you get to the sus fours yeah once you're in sus land everything's everything's tight that's like that's like like me when i was just talking to these guys earlier the piece i'm writing now it was like all shit and then i accidentally wrote a uh uh of like section in 44 8 and i was just fucking jamming to it uh for anyone wondering i am insisting it's 44 8 i still don't like it but it's two bars of 4 4 followed by four bars of 7 8 and i I refuse to have it written out, so I just put it as one measure. Oh yeah, you sent me that with those eight eight bars. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You were, yeah, yeah. It's it hip. Cool. 
finish now I'm it writing so a piece we can listen to it. To cover up the the fact that I'm absolute shit. <laughs> yeah, I'll make that. You know what? I'll make that our intro. I'll just play my fucking song in the intro. <laughs> that that section. You should just pretty, play it pretty, underneath. Pretty like like whoever's editing can underneath just put right it right underneath now. the yeah. entire podcast. Like not. <laughs> You would go fucking insane. That's be the great. point. Because the, the synth is kind of wonky. Jazz equals jazz. I, I fucked up the hertz on the synth, so it almost sounds like the the tremolo or whatever I put on should be in time, but it's not. And it wow, 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 gives wow, it a wow, really, wow, wow. really fucked up feel. But it's I'm pretty proud of it for as how shit I am. But I just, yeah, I cover up all my compositional inadequacies by making it very fucking complicated rhythmically. Same thing. Yeah, and sort of going back to uh, just starting writing young, because, you know, most places, most high schools don't teach composition, as we said. But just, like, download MuseScore, try and write something, see what happens. Cause like, and, like, score study. Like, there's, yeah. like, IMSLP, like, go look at, like, Beethoven or whatever. Like, maybe you're not into Beethoven. There's, like, so many free scores, and you just find a piece of music you like, and you just look at it, and you're like, wow, that's a whole lot of notes. We're, look at all those instruments. Wow. And you just kind of look at how it's put together. Mm-hmm. If yeah. scores scare you, try to go on the piano roll in gar- Garage Band, or just, yeah. you know, just get a, just get a keyboard and make, oh. well... Synth making a synth is an entirely different beast, but found find a s- preset sound you like and just jam on it. Yeah, That's I'm true. not gonna lie. I think try to write it down. I think like guitarists and myself as a piano player and a keyboardist definitely have an advantage because yeah. we can play our stuff solo. So for me, writing music was very naturally because it revolved around performing it, mm-hmm. which is been advantageous to me because there's no fucking money in recording music anymore if you want to make anything it's performance based or you know other avenues like that 24 hour hip hop show remix so I definitely suggest to I think everyone should learn piano like early on because the way it can give you this fundamental uh, uh, perspective of like harmony and theory I think and the way it lays it out, like you can visually see, like make a visual connection between low and high notes and, you know, the w- way Western music organizes them and visually see like a chord that the horn section is playing, you know, stacked on a piano and be like, oh, OK, they're like stacked fours or thirds. Like the way piano can give you that perspective, I think, is really advantageous and has been for me. I'm I consider myself lucky that my parents had a piano and started me very young on it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Pianos I think are great. Even if all that very mo- moderately to very accessible stuff is out of your grasp and you're a young person and you're listening, whatever instrument you play, let's you okay, you play alto saxophone in like your middle school, you know, concert band. Like you've got an instrument there uh-huh. it is. Like, go right on it. Like, just right play some it. stuff. Yeah. And when you start playing something you like, just write it down or even record it. Phone memo. And you'll figure out how to write it down later. Ask your <laughs> teacher how to yeah. write it down. Like, there's a way to do it. Like, always just try. Try to do something. Yeah, I was not meant to discourage anyone. I was just saying I was very thankful for that. But, yeah, I gr- yeah, totally no, agreed course. with Keith. Yeah, and there are absolutely times. Like, the first thing I ever arranged was just a like stand tune for my high school marching band because I thought our stand tunes weren't very good. So I decided I'll try something and it, my arrangement wasn't good either. It was, it was fine. (laughs) But after hearing the band play it, I was like, Oh, I can change this, this, and this. I went back and changed it. And over time, like now I can just bust down an arrangement in a day, but just because I did this stuff. And thankfully I had a band director who was open up, open enough to let me try these things yeah arranging in particular the more you do it the quicker you can do it it's insane um because arranging you know it's it's different than composing oftentimes yeah you're taking a song that someone else wrote but adding your own you know arrangement and things and uh yeah so i i think that's that's an awesome thing you could do and it gives you this cool feedback loop where the more you do it, you know, the the quicker you get at it. 
Mm-hmm. Um, so I thought it'd be cool if we, just to wrap up, just shared some of our own high school experiences or middle school. Uh, something I was actually thinking about that it's not really a story, but it kind of relates to um, uh, da, 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 jazz education is actually what Cody was talking about with arranging pieces that already exist, I feel like really would help with composition, getting people comfortable with that. But also, and we had a pep band at my high school and as a trumpet player in a high school pep band, whether it's football or, Oh my gosh, basketball band was fucking insane. That is, you can do whatever the fuck you want for a lot of the times. I remember taking shit up an octave all the time, taking stuff up. I mean, as a trumpet player, really my, <laughs> as a high school trumpet player, I just want it just boiled down to taking stuff up different pitches, but also like, you know, putting little turns in there or scoops, just kind of playing with the music. I, I wish I could fucking do that in my band. Now I'm lucky. I had my marching band. I remember the, f- it, took me a my entire how long have I been playing 11 years before someone told me hey like a professor hey trumpets take that up an octave and everyone went batshit crazy they're like oh, what you actually want us to play high wow <laughs> and but uh yeah pep bands are fun especially when they're given a little uh sections to improv or like you know um more freedom. So, hmm. um, one uh, fun high school gig story that uh, I really enjoy thinking about is there is a uh, like V Day, not V Day, sorry, D Day Veterans Dinner at uh, it's near like where I'm from is near the D Day Memorial due to a lot of different reasons. But uh, there's a dinner that's held there for any veterans from D Day to come, and they just want you know, swing era music to be played to remind them of the times. And they would always, I don't know if hire is the right word, but hire our, my high school's jazz band. And um, because I was a strange child, I also picked up the accordion. And by picked up, I mean, I bought one and said I could play it. <laughs> nice. And, uh, Same. That's what I do with my trumpet. I yeah. just say I can play it. <laughs> yeah. And uh, we were playing uh, the classic chart, Sentimental Journey, which was an accordion feature. And uh, I couldn't even read Trouble Clef at the time. But I was faking it pretty well. Until one of the veterans came up to me after... Well, actually, right before we were playing Sentimental Journey, because he looked on the program and he was like, so you know this song was written about me and my friends, right? And, like, that was one of the craziest things I've ever felt, because I'm like, I'm going to ruin this guy's song. (laughs) I'm about to undo this man. (laughs) Yeah, I'm about to ruin this day that's for him. And we played it, and somehow... It went okay, I think, because he didn't seem angry. But yeah, that was one of the craziest high school experiences I had, just out gigging. Well, fortunately, you were a kid, so he was probably like, I can't be mad at this kid. That's true. (laughs) He's not like, you little shit. (laughs) I had a fucking chair thrown at me in high school. Where are you at? I... I had literally got whiplash my freshman year, but I was a little bitch freshman year, so I deserved it. <laughs> um, yeah, so my I have a pretty funny story. So when I was in high school, I actually transferred schools halfway through and ended up going to this public school, Williamsville East, uh, right outside of Buffalo, that is notorious for having a really good music program and stuff. So I transferred there, and I wasn't involved in music yet because I was new. This was junior year. And I met some friends. And long story short, uh, there's this, this big event called Winterfest where a lot of the students put on performances, and you got to audition to get in. And it's really hard. Like, a lot of the people that got in and performed, like, one guy I know now is playing in like a Manhattan ensemble. You know, he's a crazy good classical musician. So anyway, uh, uh, I made friends and I was like, oh, I play piano. And 
they were like, oh, we're trying to audition uh, O'Tannenbaum. And so they gave me the chart, and I practiced it a ton because I sucked. And I, like, even, like, Same. learned parts of the, you know, solo. And I learned the intro verbatim, like, both by ear because the chart just had, like, slash notes and said piano intro. And put in, like, weeks of work because, again, I sucked. Um, and it took that much work. And they never told me the date. They were just like, oh, we'll hit you up. And I was like, oh, okay, I expected a call. And it ended up happening that the date just passed. I didn't know. And they never called me and forgot. Quote, unquote, said they forgot to ask me. So that was a sad moment. And the first time I ever got vibed. Wow. Damn. That's cold. <laughs> yeah, it was fucking cold-blooded, man. I actually... <laughs> Makes me sad thinking about. I've never been to high school. I've never done a gig. I don't have any stories. <laughs> <laughs> no, because I, cause I didn't like go out and gig at all when I was in high school. Um, I, I Actually, I played in a ska band. Uh, I was having fun about that. Like, that's... <laughs> I uh, I'm only laughing. I'm only laughing because Cody laughed. No, it's I sorry. Mean, listen, it called me off guard. If you didn't I, play I, ska I wanna, in high school. Some of our listeners want to hear about a ska band. I don't. I'm trying to think of any crazy stories. Like, I mean, we we used to go out to uh to New Hope to to record our album, and like this dude. I mean, he was like, what was his name? Oh man, I don't know. He was like. He had a dope home studio, and he had, like, one arm, and he looked like Quentin Tarantino, and, like, he was pretty cool. Um, and, like, I, I kept trying to, like, do solos over our, our like, tracks because there would be a spot that they would leave for a solo. And then I – that was, like, when I started realizing I didn't really know how to improvise on trombone. Um and also, like, the fact that I played in the ska band led my high school band director to think that I did know how to improvise on trombone. And so, like, with our, like, advanced jazz band, he would, like, like, he had me solo over a chart, but, like, he never taught me how to, like, read changes or do anything. So every time I would go up to do this solo, I was so into it, and I was, like, I knew none of what the notes were to play. And I don't, I never to this day because there's no evidence of it i will never know if it was bad or good or if i was just like feeling myself or what just the but lick. yeah uh-huh. <laughs> i would just play like high notes and i'd i don't know i looked like i was having a great time though that was that's, that's the probably story. makes it yeah you gotta look good to play good yeah but now i yeah. now i know how to do it more so that's my story all right well We'll start wrapping up, or we will wrap up right now. Um, <laughs> this has been the oh, let's oh, this is always fun. I'm gonna catch you guys off guard. This has been the woodshed with Andy Brent. Oh, they don't what? even go for it. What? what? I, you, 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 you cut, cut out. out. <laughs> oh shit! Oh, yeah, I didn't place. hear anything. <laughs> Fuck! Damn it! <laughs> what did you just say? <laughs> what did you say? I was gonna say. I was gonna the shout out section this, or not the shout out but this has been the woodshed with Andy Brent oh, <laughs> oh, just, just see who goes first I get it alright third time's the charm third time's quiet. the charm we got this <laughs> third time's the charm <laughs> we're figments of Andy Brent's imagination on this oh, has gosh. been the woodshed yeah I, I call out for I call out for my friends wait. and it just turns out no one fucking is here. It wait, all what? just fucking ends right now. Wait, it what's the ends. order? I've never been talking to anyone then, this whole time. I've been this hearing is the chaos. What is the order that we should go in? Obviously, <laughs> that was the joke. Oh, okay. <laughs> all right, this has been the woodshed with Andy Brent and Cody Logan, Donnie Fronoffer, Keith Lally. And we'll see you tomorrow night. No, no, we won't. Bye. (laughs) All right, that's a wrap. Okay, that went as chaotic as I (laughs) as I wanted to. It's always good to end like that.